Welcome to the first 2023 episode of Hollywood Kitchen. Yay! Once again, my friend and frequent partner in crime, Lara Gabriel, is joining me today. She is the author of the incredible biography, The Captain of Her Soul, The Life of Marion Davies. And since Marion Davies is star of the month on Turner Classic Movies All Month, Laura and I thought it would be an awesome idea to kind of maybe do a bunch of episodes about Marion's friends and co-stars since we did a Marion episode back in December. So today we are going to talk about Marion's very good friend and co-star, the great Billy Haynes. Yay! Laura, for people that are tuning in who don't know anything about him and they're completely like a clean slate, what would you tell them about Billy Haynes? Well, I would start by saying that Billy Haynes is somebody who is is very relevant, I would say, to today because he uh, he was a big star. He was a big star in the 20s and uh, his career essentially fell apart in the early 30s because uh, he was gay. Billy Haynes was gay and he was he had a long term partner. Who was with him until in, until he died 50 years yeah and and um but rumors were starting to swirl and the the uh the story is that louis b mayer called him into the office and said look you got to get married or you can't be here anymore and uh billy haynes essentially said something like i'm already married and quit so from today, from the perspective of today, this is a guy who really stood up for himself and and was a very forward thinking ahead of his time type of uh, person. And and he how well he relates to Marion Davies a lot, but but one of the ways in which he relates to Marion Davies is after he left Hollywood. Uh, he was he was thinking about what he might do next. He wasn't really sure. He was spending some time at Hearst Castle. He loved Hearst Castle. Marion and Hearst both really loved him. And uh, Hearst had noticed in previous visits that he would had a real eye for antiques. He had a talent for for sort of eyeing different styles and periods. And and so Mark Hearst was a little bit of a mentor to him. And so after he left Hollywood and he didn't know what he was going to do, Hearst said, look, you've got this gift for antiques and for, um, you know, design and decorating. Why don't you try that? So he did. And it was it was at Hearst's suggestion that he started this interior design business. And it became this big, lucrative business for him. And he is known now for, uh, in certain circles, as a designer and not necessarily as an actor. So, and he had all these big stars. Marion was a big client of his. Joan Crawford was a big client of his. Yeah, so, so what an interesting guy. Oh, absolutely. And it had to have taken so much courage back then, especially because it's not like today. And the danger that someone might have faced for just living their truth and being who they were was it's definitely a very different world. At the time. Exactly. I mean, he was as out as he could possibly be in the 20s. Um, you know, of course, it wasn't made, it wasn't put in the papers that Billy Haynes is leaving because he's gay, but but he he quit the business because he couldn't live as himself in the business. Then if you think about it, to have to be something you're not and do something that's not right for you. That had to have been kind of a real soul sucking proposition. Yeah. You know? Like, and I think some of them took the bait. Rock Hudson at one point had married his, um, you know, or had married his agent's secretary or something. So a lot yeah. of them did, you know, do that to save their careers. But to kind of have the guts to just say, I'm done and walk away, that's that's really incredible. Yeah. And I have an interview with him. I have a an interview on, on tape with him that's really cool. Um, he is clearly this, this um, how, how do I want to say, like, like confident, secure in himself uh, guy. And I think a lot of that 
probably came from the choices that he made, you know, that he, he made the choice to live uh, as himself and not sell out um, and stay with his, with his partner, Jimmy. And they, uh, they stayed together all the way through, you know, until he died in 1973, until Billy died in 1973. So, yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about his films. We're going to talk about his friendships. We're going to cover a lot of Billy Haynes territory today. Yeah. Uh, first, we'll talk about the food because when you and I decided to do Billy Haynes, Billy is a southerner like me and he's from Virginia. And I found a Virginia ham recipe and I was like, eh, I don't do a lot of ham. I know you don't. I don't do ham. No. Yes. <laughs> and then I found a sandwich recipe, which I sent you, which I think we both found pretty, pretty bizarre. <laughs> so we decided that Billy was not, I've never read anything about him being a cook, so I think we can take some license here. And I've got to say, eBay is probably one of mankind's great innovations, in addition to like the wheel and fire, because I found this 1965 First Castle cookbook, which I showed you recently in San Francisco, and you were able to confirm a lot of the information in this thing. There are certain things, yeah, certain things that that add up and certain things that we figured out, okay, they're covering things up here. They're veiling stuff. Exactly. And yeah. you and I, we talked about a lot of different recipes. And in addition to the recipe choices I make for the show, I try to do stuff that's reasonably simple and in my wheelhouse, but also stuff that is seasonal. Like right now, it's cooler outside. And also, I haven't really done that many potato dishes. So you and I settled on Leonese, if that's how you pronounce it, Leonese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very easy recipe, which I like a lot. Yes, me too. All about us uh, starting small here. So yeah. I do have my hot plate out. I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. To make Leonese potatoes, I'm scaling mine down considerably because it's just me. But you need six peeled cold sliced cooked potatoes. It didn't say how to cook them or how long to cook them. So I just got a potato and put it in the oven for 30 minutes. And that's I put mine in the microwave. Okay. <laughs> so I've got my potato right here. I didn't have time to take the skins off. I'm so sorry, but okay. So I've got my sliced potatoes. I sliced mine in like a, a circular fashion. And wait, then... wait, hold on, Carrie. I've got it. There's a funny comment. Somebody, oh, okay. somebody yeah, Leslie Apple says Billy would appreciate the joke of associating him with Virginia ham. <laughs> good, good one, Leslie. That's really, that's really good. Thank you, Leslie. That's awesome. So then, okay, so we have three tablespoons of butter. We have pepper, salt, which I have my little caddy right here. And then we have a pinch of garlic, which I don't know how much a pinch is, but this should be fine. And then we have minced onion. So I'm going to go ahead and fire up the hot plate here. Okay, I, I forgot to take the butter out, so I'm just going to do this really quickly. I think this is probably enough butter. But Billy was a frequent visitor to Hearst Castle, so it kind of yeah. makes sense that he probably would have eaten this. He loved Hearst Castle. And in fact, in the interview that I have uh, with him, he remembered, I mean, this was, you know, this was in the in the late 60s so this was like shortly before he died and so he was he was remembering like 40 years before and he remembered every single little tiny detail and mm -hmm. and perfectly i mean like you he was describing the refectory from memory and and uh, you look at the uh, the photo of the refect refectory and it's like yeah that's exactly what he said it's amazing wow yeah he lo he loved it so I'm heating up the butter in the skillet. Now it says to add potatoes, onions, and seasonings. Saute without stirring until oh. brown on the underside. Turn okay, we're sauteing without stirring, huh? That's what it says, but you know how these recipes are. We might have to just, you know, kind of uh, go off script a bit. All right, so we're add the potatoes. Okay. Ah. So I have a little bit of garlic that I'll just kind of go like this. All my potatoes are not going to fit in this particular skillet, but I will try. Okay. We just need a pinch, right? Yeah, I think that's probably good enough. All right, now I'm going to add my onions and my seasonings. 
Cutting the onions. Um, what am I doing? I feel like I started doing something not right. Um, okay. I'm going to add my three fourths tablespoon of salt. I'm just going to kind of do this by by sight here. Yeah. And pepper, a little bit of pepper. Okay. All right. Now I guess I just let it sit here and saute. Oh, it smells really good. Yeah. It smells great, actually. I think I did um, Vincent Price's uh, potato recipe at one point, and then I did a Margarita Dietrich potato salad. So this might be only the third potato recipe I've done on Hollywood Kitchen. Hmm. Yeah, this one, it's really easy, but man, that smells good. Did you, did you put garlic in there? Yeah, I did. I got my garlic pressed and pressed down some fresh garlic. So did I, yeah. I kind of gotten to where I like to do that even more than like just use the canned garlic salt, you know? Yeah. Right. This does smell really good. Oh wow. Right. Is there any, so, any more comments? The last one I'm seeing is is Leslie's so um, Billy Haynes joke. I first discovered Billy Haynes, like my first exposure to him was when I saw Marion in show people. Same. And he's so good in that. I remember oh. thinking two things when I first saw show people. My first thought was, my gosh, Marion is incredibly talented. I have been lied to by all these people who said she wasn't. And then my second thought was, who is this adorable man who is her co-star? He's so cute. He's funny. He's got razor sharp comic timing. And seeing that the chemistry they had in the film, it really made me want to see more of Billy Haynes for sure. Yeah. And, you know, an interesting thing, too, about Billy Haynes and show people is that he wasn't supposed to be the first. He wasn't the first choice. Oh, who was? Uh, James Murray, actually. Oh, that's right. From uh, the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So James Murray was was supposed to be to be in it. Um, King Vidor wanted to give him some work. And and then what happened was for the first three days of shooting, he just didn't show up. Um. So, you know, clearly having some problems as James Murray did, you know, so, yeah. so they were forced to replace him after three days and their production was falling behind and, you know, so they, they got Billy um, and boy, what a great choice that was. Oh, yeah. By the way, for people who don't know, James Murray was a silent film actor. He started in the King Vidor silent film, The Crowd, but unfortunately he struggled very badly with uh mental illness and addiction and unfortunately his career and life did not did not last long yeah very very sad life very sad story okay i think that this is it i mean is your sizzling very loudly yes it is and i i, I turned it off because i'm afraid that the the fire alarm is going to go off me too, me too. I'm gonna turn mine like way down. Okay, we'll just let these potatoes saute or brown here while we chat. And yeah. So another thing that I think is really cool about Billy Haynes is his versatility because I first saw him in Show People and of course saw his comic timing and physical comedy and he's terrific. But then I saw him in Tell It to the Marines with Lon Chaney. And he holds his own against Cheney, which could not have been easy to do. And he's really terrific in that movie. Yeah, yeah, no, he's he was a great actor. Like, you know, as we as we were saying, um, he was a huge huge star in in the twenties. And in fact, he um, had a quote. I keep referring back to this interview I have with him, which you know I will probably keep doing because it's a great interview. Yeah, um, you know, I, uh, yeah but but he. Um, he was saying that when he got got called for show people, the, the studio told him that they needed him because he was he was such a big star. Like like uh, his quote was, "I didn't need her; she needed me." You know, which is probably true. Wow, I think he was the number one male box office draw in nineteen thirty. Yeah. I'm not yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Um, that sounds right. And another notable thing about Billy Haynes, I think, was his friendship and mentorship of Joan Crawford. Yeah. 
Hopper arrived at MGM in 1925, and she was playing Norma Shearer's shoulder in Lady of the Night. And <laughs> yes. we could talk for so long about that. But and then she and Billy struck up a friendship. And Joan was so new, she's still learning how to do makeup, how to, you know, adjust to being a starlet at MGM. And apparently she and Billy got very, very close. And he kind of told her, you've got to get attention for yourself. So he encouraged her to do the Charleston contests which got her a yeah. lot of attention and he kind of worked with her. I almost wonder if it was a little bit like show people in terms of Crawford in the Marion Davies role where she's just new to the studio and he's kind of helping her along. Yeah. They starred in a couple of films together. I think uh, the ones that come to mind are Spring Break and West Point. Right. Yeah, sorry, I'm 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 looking at the comments as as you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, there's some really great ones, so I'm trying to sort of listen and read the comments at the same time. Um, uh, Benjamin Meisner, Benjamin <laughs> Meisner says, "I love Carol Lombard's quote that Billy Haynes was her best girlfriend." Oh, that's great. Well, I love Joe Crawford's quote too, that she and Billy were the happiest married couple in Hollywood. Yeah, and you know that quote was uh, was repeated also by. Um, Oh gosh, was it? I need a, I, it's on one of my tapes. It's on, um, it was either Francis Marion or uh, Eleanor Boardman, I think. Um, I, for, I forget which one it was, but somebody else said that quote as well. Um, so that seemed to be something that went around that, that quote about them. Um, it's really close to Joan Crawford. And apparently I've heard this story many times that he she was Lucille Lucer when they met and then he um she didn't like the name Crawford and they talked about it but he was like saying that she should keep it because it sounds a lot better than it could have if they'd given her something else and that he just really was a huge source of support and encouragement to Joan when she was kind of on her way up at MGM yeah they had a really great friendship the two of them yeah I think that's cool and Joan continued to support him even when he left MGM she did it just say goodbye to him she still had him decorate her homes and redecorate her homes and they were still in each other's lives long after billy was was out of the business yeah she was such a great support to him and he her obviously i mean you know the you know it's, it's true friendship yeah because you know a lot of times in the business especially people are friends with you because they can get something from you and I'm sure for Joan, she had that friendship with Billy because she probably knew, okay, he liked me when I wasn't anybody. He, you know, when she was just Lucille Lassour, they became friends. So to know that he liked her maybe for her and not just for what she could get him. Yeah. You know, yeah. Assuring thing. I'm thinking as we're talking um, about Joan Crawford and Billy Haynes of how similar that relationship is uh to the relationship between Peggy and Billy and show people yeah yeah because I think there are a lot of similarities you know because I'm sure there were a ton of starlets struggling to be popular just like Joan I mean for every Joan there's probably 100 other girls trying to, for the same goal and I really think that uh having Billy as sort of a mentor and a guide that had to have been really helpful yes I'm sure it was Everybody needs that. Because you've got to distinguish yourself. And Joan certainly did that. Because she used to say, if I could just get a film dancing, I know it could make me a star. And of course, she got Our Dancing Daughters, which, by the way, is coming out on Blu-ray on January 10th. And I told oh, really? you, you told me this restoration of it is absolutely stunning. Who did the restoration? Uh, Warner Brothers Archive. Oh, great. Yeah. So uh, it's going to arrive in my mailbox this week, hopefully. Yay. To see that. Because yeah, that was the star making performance above all others that really put Joan, you know, in the top spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a couple of other comments here. Catherine Bird says, when I watched Singing in the Rain for the 1500th time the other day, I noticed for the first time a William Haynes movie poster behind Gene Kelly uh, and cast outside the theater after the pre preview that went bad. Yeah, I, I remember that. I can't remember what movie it was, though. What was the movie that they had? Yeah, remember, I'll have to look that up. I'm kind of shocked. The poster? Um, it wouldn't be too hard to find. I would, you know, can just like look up the clip or something. But um, but yeah, I remember that. Yeah, definitely. And 
he did make a transition into sound, but as you said, he, I think part of it was he just did a big part of it, obviously, it was he just didn't want to conform and didn't want to bow to the pressure. And then part of it could have been too, I think there was like this desire for a new crop of stars when that's true came in. And so a lot of times, like that line in the artist where they say out with the old and in with the new, I think mm-hmm. the sense of okay, out with you guys and in with a new class of or crop of of, of stars. Yeah. Yeah. He had a beautiful voice. I mean, if you, if you hear him talk, I mean, his voice is just very mellifluous and, and, and gorgeous. Um, so it certainly wasn't that. Yeah, it definitely wasn't that at all. And tell me the story you've told me about Marion helping him when he and Jimmy were attacked. Like, that's a really powerful story. Yeah, it is. And it speaks to a lot of Marion's character as well as, as well as, um, you know their their friendship billy and jimmy were on jimmy's his partner um were on the beach uh one day and they were together and clearly you know they were out in the open so they were being a little bit discreet but they were clearly like together right and um a group of teenagers started harassing them and started, um, you know, and 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 they kind of got up and you know were walking off, and they followed them and started started attacking them. I mean, started like like beating them up, throwing things at them, and um, and it was a, a a terrible scene. And it was it was in the papers. And um, uh, after this happened, you know, Billy and Jimmy were were really scared of. Um, being in that house, it was a rented house, as I recall. It was a rented house on on the beach. They were they were kind of scared of being there. And so Marion said, "Come up to San Simeon." And they spent some time at San Simeon for a while after that after that attack. And Marion was so incensed that this happened. I mean, she was just she was like beside herself that people would do this. And so she um, she she called the papers. And, you know, she, of course, had had power through the through the Hearst press. Um, She she called the papers and said, I want you to find these people, prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. Um, This is so unacceptable. These people should not be walking around. And she was so, like, passionate about it that Billy had to tell her, no, like, don't just calm down. I don't, we don't want this attention. We don't want, we don't want it to be in the papers because it's, it'll, it'll be worse for us. Oh, yeah. the papers. And yeah. so, um, so only when Billy told her to stop, um, did she let up, but she, she was so upset about it. So angry. Um, yeah. So, uh, so they stayed at San Simeon for a bit and then they went back to their, their normal place. So. And there's a book, I haven't read it yet. I need to. It's called, um, I think it's called Wisecracker. And yeah. it's J Man mm-hmm. about Billy Haynes. And also I found an interior decoration book about that whole part of his career, but it started at like a hundred something dollars for a used copy. So I'm guessing it's kind of a really rare book that's uh hard to find. Yeah, yeah. Wisecracker is the only one I have. Okay. How was that book? Yeah, it's it's um it's it's interesting. It's uh certainly more than has been written about Billy Haynes in any sort of accessible way um by anybody. So so it's it's very useful. I got I got a few uh a few interesting tidbits from it. Yeah. Okay. Have you read it? I haven't read that one. No. I thought I had it somewhere around here, but I guess I don't. So I clearly need to get that one. Yeah, you can borrow it. I have it. You can bring it down for you. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think he's someone that I wish people knew more of him. Like he's not nearly as well known, I think, today as he probably deserves to be. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think part of that is that he retired so early and his movies were popular, but at popular at the time, but none of them have achieved sort of the except for show people um have achieved the sort of big status that other stars films have 
Definitely. That probably really goes against. And some of them just aren't available. Like when I was getting ready for this episode, I was kind of looking up the number of Billy Haynes movies that are even seeable today by the average consumer. And there's not a ton of them. I mean, some of them are, but it's not like his entire career is just super readily available. Yeah, right. I mean, there's there's um, My Best Girl, right? The Pickford um, movie that he was mm-hmm. he was in. My Best Girl, right? I think um, so. Yeah, and, um, and show people. But, you know, not, not a lot of things in that uh, are really readily available. And um, some of them you can find on Warner Archive, but some of them you can't even find them there. So... It's not like, you know, there's just a zillion Billy Haynes movies out there for people to consume. Yeah. But um, I really, oh, but I, uh, Heather, Heather uh, Ripley. Hi, Heather. Um, Heather wants to know what we're making. We're making Potatoes Leonez. Potatoes Leonez, for those just joining us. Um, when Laura and I talked about doing this episode, I'll just recap. We found two recipes attributed to Billy Haynes. One was for Virginia ham, which neither <laughs> of us really are, were going, willing to go down that road. Mm-hmm. And the other one was for a really bizarre sandwich, which we were both like, no. What so, was that sandwich again? I don't remember, but it was like a ton of stuff that all shouldn't really be together. And it was strange. And I'm like, I'm not eating that. So, yeah. Yeah. Was, well, that, I, was, that, was that in the first cast cookbook or no? That was no, that was one of the fan magazines. Oh, yeah. Some of those fan magazine sandwiches are real head scratchers, I have to say. <laughs> But, but I found this first castle cookbook on eBay from 1965. And so that's that's what we're working with here. Yes. Are, are, yours, are yours done? Your potatoes? They are. Let me show you. Oh, that looks good. I think, um, looks good. I think they're pretty brown here. Yeah, let me let me get mine. I think if I did it anymore, they would start to burn actually. <laughs> How are they? I haven't eaten one yet. I'm uh, I'm gonna take a few off here and let them cool before I pop one in my mouth. Mmm. Oh, it's good. Really? Oh yeah. Oh wow. It, they taste like. They taste like potato wedges, you know, like like the, the the wedges with the garlic on them. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's what they taste the like. Is that you could put it with almost anything, like almost any sort of main dish. This could be a complimentary side dish. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, this definitely looks like a like a side dishy type of uh, situation. Yeah, I love having good side dishes like at my disposal. Yes. Yeah, it, it feels like it would be good for Thanksgiving or something. Mm, winter time for sure. Yeah. Oh, you're right. This is good. Very flavorful. Yes. Mmm. Mmm. All right. You know, it's so simple. It's such a simple dish. I, I wasn't sure how it would taste, like if it would taste simple or whatever, but but it, it doesn't. It, t- it tastes very complex. Yeah. And um yeah, the first castle cookbook really knows what it's doing. Yeah, you know, we should do more from this for fun because like yeah. stuff in here that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. The, the alternate to garlic was sage. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, garlic or sage, yeah. Yeah. That would that would be really interesting. Or or both. You could put garlic and sage in there. Oh, definitely. You could even put rosemary in here. I mean, you could do a lot with the spices on this one. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is a documentary on Billy Haynes as well out on YouTube. So um, oh. I think I'll post about that later if people want to like watch a documentary. Yeah. He really, he really should have a renaissance hmm. in, this, in this day and age, especially because of his situation. Like Marion that are so ripe for rediscovery. So I think Billy is in that category. Billy is like really deserves a day on TCM in the summer of the star. Like he's really ripe for being rediscovered at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with a lot of discussion beforehand about like why we're doing Billy Haynes and who he was, and yeah, that would be that would be great. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And he also looked like just a really fun person who really enjoyed life. Like anytime you see photos of him that are candid, he just looks like he's 
he's having a great time and he's really just like happy to be here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me, you know what? I have an idea. Hold yeah. on. Um, let me see. I don't know if, if we can, because the tape, the tape that the interview is on is, um, it's a, it's a weird tape. It's like a little tape. Okay. That is only played in, in a special uh, tape player. And I don't know if the tape player that I have has speakers. But I'm going to go check. Okay. I'm going to go check and see if maybe we can hear a little bit of Billy. Just, just one sec. Oh, that would be so cool. Okay. I will be right back. Okay. Meanwhile, I will check questions and comments and see if we have any more rolling in about Billy Haynes. see heather says only make what you will eat yes that is kind of a guideline for me on doing these episodes because there's a lot of celebrity recipes i look at and think there's no way on earth i'm going to eat that so i really i don't want to waste food it's expensive so yes i always try to make something i am willing to consume ah oh, gary songer thank you he found the 45 minute documentary on youtube on billy haynes yes and he agrees with me that they should have a star of, he should be part of Summer of the Stars if he's not been already. So yes, and very good. That would be great. And fingers crossed that Lara can find that interview. Anne Stone, you just ordered the book. Excellent. I need to get that book too, because I don't, I'm going to borrow that from Laura. I don't have that one. And sad news. Um, the tape recorder thing doesn't have speakers. So unfortunately we can't do it. And my, I, I don't have speakers. Like I don't have speakers that I can plug into, but, yep. um, but I only have headphones, which is really sad. Sorry about that, everybody. That's okay. You tried. And that's, that's I tried. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he was, he was quite a, quite a person. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just around, it's such an interesting time in history too, you know, I just, I feel very fascinated by the period of not only the silent era, but that transition into sound when a lot of upheaval, of course, happened in Hollywood and Billy was kind of smack dab in the middle of all that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And he, he so easily could have made that transition, I think, but say la vie. And had he wanted to, I mean, had he been willing to play ball? Exactly. Had he been willing to sell himself out? Yeah. Um, but around a lot longer, but you've got to do what's right for you and make the choices that are right for your life, of course. Yeah. He, so he wasn't willing to sell himself out and he wasn't willing to sell Jimmy out. Yeah. That's, I, I wish I could have met him. You know how there's some stars that you think, wow, I admire them. There's no way I'd want to meet them. Billy's really? one of those stars where you're like, yeah, I'm so bummed that he left the world before I got into the world, you know, because yeah, it's been delightful to know. Yes, I agree. Um strikes me as that kind of person that would have been just a lot of a lot of fun to know. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. I always hear people from like my grandparents' generation, they use the phrase, you can't miss what you never had. And I don't get that phrase at all because I miss a lot of things I've never had. I miss, you yes. know, I will never see that are lost. People that have gone, I will never get to meet. Like, I miss things I've never had. Yeah, I mean. And I can say on it, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess it would depend on what your definition of the word miss is, because you can miss, you can miss not having something, right? Like, like, um, you know, you can miss never having, you know, met one of these stars, but you can't. I don't know. Yeah, it's if you if you never met the stars and you couldn't miss like something physical about them, maybe like that you would have if you had met them. I don't know. I kind of get it, but also kind of not. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. But um, yeah. So, do you have any other thoughts on Billy? Any other? He didn't have a super long film career, so I feel like no, it's he really didn't. Do a long. He was also in Hollywood Review of nineteen twenty nine with Marion, and they're doing the singing in the rain at the end. The singing in the rain number. Um, 
Yes, which of course now makes me think of Babylon. Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> I think we should in a way because you and I are probably both getting asked about that movie left, right, and center. I yeah. it. The thing is, I have not seen it yet. I just feel like I do not have it in my soul to sit for three hours and nine minutes and watch it at this time. I probably will see it at a certain point, but I'm a little concerned for a lot of reasons. Yeah. There are a few historians that I know who absolutely love it, and I know they know silent film. It's very polarizing. Very polarizing. I've never heard anyone go, yeah, Babylon's just okay. It's either been like, I hate that movie with the intensity of a thousand burning suns, mm -hmm. or I love that movie, best film of the year. There's there's no in between. Yeah. Oh, I, I have not seen it yet. Well, you saw it. Tell us what you thought. <laughs> I hesitate to say on camera. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I didn't like it at all. I thought it was, I, I thought that it was not, um, it was not respectfully done. It was not accurately done. It wasn't, um, it wasn't something that reflects well on the culture of the 1920s. And it doesn't reflect accurately on the culture of the 1920s. So anyway, you don't, it doesn't have, reflecting on the culture of the 1920s doesn't have to reflect on it well. I th think that that's, you know, that's, that's okay, but it has to be accurate. You know, you can't just like have your vision and, and make people think something that's totally wrong because it's your vision. I mean, that's my perspective. You have responsibility, I think. I haven't seen it yet, as I said, but just looking at the trailer or the photos from it, as someone who collects vintage clothing and really lives a lot to a great extent in that era, it just doesn't look right to me, at least for the Margot Robbie character, the hair, the makeup, the clothes, like women's bodies were not tanned and completely ripped in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. you know, her hair looks like, as my friend Susie said, shout out to Susie. She looks like she's in a white snake video from like the 90s. <laughs> yeah. I laughed out loud when she said that to me. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't look as it would look, you know? And, and the nail in the coffin for me was the what they did to Marion. You know, there was one scene with Marion, one scene with Marion and Hearst, and it was so bad. It was, you know, there have been bad portrayals of Marion Davies on screen. No this, this. And this, this one is like no research, nothing. Um, it, it, she was just there and saying stuff that would have been said by other people, but not her. And, you know, they made her out to seem like a snob, she which is wasn't. Which the opposite of what she was. And helping low income children in in West LA with her clinic that she found yeah. is not a snob. No. Yeah, that was, that was that was terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. So you know, I to be honest, I find it hard to see a lot of these kind of biopics because when you, as you and I do, kind of eat, sleep, drink, breathe classic Hollywood, and then they make a movie about that. It's very hard because you can't just enjoy it like a normal viewer. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the average person off the street, because we have too much closeness, I think, to this material. So for both of us, it's just so hard to remove yourself from that. Like I still never saw the Judy Garland film with Renee Zellger. I didn't see the Lucille Ball movie with Nicole Kidman. I just, I just haven't gone down those roads yet. Yeah. I saw the the Judy movie with Renee Zellweger. I did not like it. Um, <laughs> no, it's yeah. They use hers. I'm like, no, 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 over and out. Yeah, over and out, exactly. <laughs> I did, however, I will say that the Judy Davis film that they did based on Lorna Love's book, that was very good. That was good. Yeah, that I was like, okay, I would give that my thumbs up. Yeah, Judy Davis was great. Um one other thing that I want to say about Babylon that somebody somebody who's been following my Facebook page may have read but um, <laughs> my first I was laughing throughout the whole first scene the whole you know big um big orgy scene I was laughing throughout that whole scene because I thought I kept thinking this is Will Hayes's idea of what Hollywood <laughs> what was going on in Hollywood every night like <laughs> this is why he 
implemented you know his his like morality stuff it's like this is what he thought was happening it wasn't what was happening but this is what he thought it's like how did we get inside will hayes's mind seriously well there are you know i was just talking with a friend the other day there are a lot of wild party orgy scenes in cecil b demille films and eric von stroheim films as we know very well those yeah. guys love them a good party scene Mm -hmm. But I think those would be more accurate, honestly, to how it looked then, because they were made then. Yeah. You know? Right. And I think those would be my much more close reflection. Yeah. You know, what it looked like. Also, for those of you who are new to silent film and or want to learn a lot more about it, Kevin Brownlow and David Gill did an incredible series called Hollywood the Pioneers. I think it was for BBC back in like 1980 or something. Uh, the whole series is on YouTube, and normally I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. However, it's only on VHS. It's never going to come out on DVD because of rights issues. So I really recommend that series because it's so good. It's so thorough, and there's so many stars they cover, things they cover about life at that time in Hollywood in the 20s, and I just can't recommend that series enough. Mm-hmm. Somebody says in the chat, oh, it's Heather. Heather says, sadly, sometimes very private or shy people can be misinterpreted as a snob. That's true, but Marion was, you know, was not that. So was were they portraying her as a snob in relation to Clara Bow and how she was kind of treated in Hollywood? I.e. Yeah, this the scene is that um the scene is that the Clara Bow character, Nellie Leroy, comes to a, a party. She comes to a party, sorry, um, with this columnist character named Eleanor St. John. Clearly a combination of Eleanor Glynn and Adela Roger St. John's, but you know. Um, anyway, so she comes to this party, and then Eleanor Eleanor St. John yells out, Billy, which is supposed to be WR. It's like Billy? Like nobody ever called him Billy. Like what you know, anyway. So <laughs> so they go over to this group of people that is like WR and Marion and a couple other people. And and Marion is part of this group that's like laughing at her and and kind of making fun of her. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, no. Marion would never, ever, ever have done that. Now, I know Clara Bow was shunned by a lot of people in Hollywood because she was kind of really crass and she mm -hmm. wasn't really raised at all. Her parents, her mother, I right. just slit her throat and killed her. Her dad, you know, abused her sexually and in every sense of the word. Right. So she, she was kind of really crude and didn't really have any sort of social graces. But and I've seen the, the Hollywood, the Pioneers documentary and other documentaries that talk about how Clara was kind of treated by others, but it never talks about Marion specifically treating her that way. No, no. So I thought that was really irresponsible. That was really irresponsible of Damien Chazelle to do that. Did Clara ever meet Marion or did their paths ever cross? Because they were at different studios and they were kind of different types. They were at different studios. Um, they kind of kept, they, they had different lives. They probably met at, at one point or another, but I don't have any stories. Yeah. Yeah, Mary didn't really talk about her. Mm -hmm. Well, Claire seems so like freewheeling that I don't know. I it's just I think she would probably have partied with the more average people, like the mm -hmm. different average people that she knew as opposed to like other movie stars, except maybe occasionally or something. But yeah. And honestly, though, Marion did too. Marion was, you know, there was everybody at a Marion Davis party, you know, there were crew members and and um people from Marion's chorus girl days oh that's great. yeah yeah so you wrote in your book that those were the happiest days of her life why do you or, think um I think there was probably a combination of the fact that she was um the fact that she was young and able to sort of enjoy this really vivacious life and also Marion considered chorus girls to be the most generous people on earth 
Um, she said that. Wow. And, and so she, she really thrived in this environment of people who were vivacious and energetic and yet so giving, right? I mean, every time there was a benefit, you know, every time that uh, there, there was a show that was going to benefit some charity, all the chorus girls showed up. At other shows, you know, there would be some absent and, you know, they wouldn't have a full cast. But at benefits, they were all there. And Marion, that really had, had a, a big impression on Marion. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that she just found it. She liked the culture. She liked the culture of the chorus, chorus life. Well, and then movies, you have to get up at the crack of dawn every day. It's these really grueling long days. And the chorus, I'm sure you perform all night, sleep all day. It's a totally different, like... And that was her preferred, she kept that preferred sleep schedule for her whole life. I mean, obviously she couldn't keep it when she was in movies, but after she retired, she reverted to that sleep schedule, you know, the uh, sort of nocturnal, um, nocturnal life. Wow. Mm -hmm. So after she retired, there weren't a lot of, she didn't have a lot of, of those, those parties, you know, because everybody was sleeping. Um, yeah, she was alone a lot. Wow. And another thing that I really loved about your book too, was how you talk about how her friends wanted to show that they didn't want anything from her because she was so generous. She would just take the bracelet off and hand it to them. Or she just, yeah. her friends tried to be like, we just like you for you and not for yeah. this other stuff. Yeah. There was a group of friends who made it a pact among themselves that they would never accept anything that Marion tried to give them um, because they wanted, is in Francis Marion's words, um, you know, Mar uh, Francis Marion said, Marion, you've got to learn that we love you for you and not for what you give us. Wow. Yeah. And reading your book, it just comes across what a generous, extraordinary soul she truly was. Yeah. Yeah, she really was. She was a rare human being. And coming up, she is Star of the Month on TCM. And yeah, this maybe. coming is Tuesday night, right? Tuesday nights. Tuesday night. So what's coming up this Tuesday night and what should people look for? So Tuesday night is show people. So definitely that. My the favorite. Patsy. Um, I said the Patsy. Um, Marianne, which is Marianne's first, uh, well, the first the first time that audiences heard Marianne Davies talk on screen, I like to say. So that's an interesting one. Um, do we have Blondie this week? Hold on, I'm, I'm going to get the schedule so that I can actually tell people what's what's on. Um, and by the way, for those of you who watch Hollywood Kitchen, our future episodes this month about the the six degrees of Marion, as it were, we're going to do an episode on Billy Dove. I think that's next week. We're going to make yeah. Billy's feather cake, and the week after that, we're going to make or no, the end of the month, we're going to make Dorothy McHale's popovers. Yes, we know them to be delicious and old favorite. Yes, indeed. Yes, and Danny's. I'm going to probably do that one at Danny's house. So Danny and Charles and Kendall can all eat poppers as well. Yeah. Um. Okay. So let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Schedule. Um. Oh, it's taking forever. This is TCM. This new TCM schedule thing is really annoying. All right. So we have. Patsy's first. Okay, Patsy's first before show people. Okay. Patsy, show people, Marianne, then the Floridor Girl, Not So Dumb, and the Hollywood Review of 1929. So of those, let me go to the Patsy. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning and I'll say a little bit about each movie. So the Patsy is um, probably Marion Davies' best um, performance, I would say. It's where we get to see what Marion Davies was really capable of. Um, in terms of comedy, physical comedy, she's she is really a, a proto screwball comedian. She's she's kind of the the founder of screwball comedy before screwball comedy was a thing. Absolutely, yeah. And and so that's really fun. We get uh, Marion with Marie Dressler and just a great ensemble cast as well. And the impressions, I love that. The is the best. impressions, yes. The impression. Marion was a, an extraordinarily talented impressionist, and we get to see that 
here. Um, she, I, I was at the AFI Silver a couple weeks ago and we showed um, the cardboard lever where she does an impression of Jetta Goodall. And uh, after it was over, somebody came up to me and said, you know, I knew that Marion could do impressions, but that was some next level stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, that's that's about right. That's some next level stuff right there. Um, so we've got Patsy, then we've got Show People, which is a masterpiece, a silent masterpiece with Billy Haynes. Thank you very much. And filmed on location in Hollywood and on the MGM studios. So that's a big bonus. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and so if you haven't seen Show People, see show people i mean that's it's just it's it's a delight so you, you will not regret that one uh marianne again first talkie if you can believe it uh it's kind of a musical version of the big parade um if that is if that is something you can fathom at all and uh the floor door girl is really fun it takes a lot of uh a, a lot of things from marianne davies own life part of it was filmed at the beach house um at, on the beach in front of in front of her house and it has a technicolor sequence so that's fun and premiered at the pantages theater in hollywood which is an art deco masterpiece of a it building. opened the pantages theater so the uh the pantages theater um you know was just about ready to open and they decided they were going to open it with the floridora girl and so the premiere of the florida floridora girl was also the opening of the pantages um not So Dumb is uh, King Vidor's third movie with Marion, third and final film with Marion, and only talky. Um, it's, it, there are some parts of it that are really great. Um, it, it doesn't measure up to the Patsy and show people, but um, but Mar Marion is, is very sweet in it and very um, exuberant. It might be the closest, I think, in the talkies that she came to her silent persona. Um, so that's an interesting, interesting thing to think about too. And then Hollywood Review of 1929 is really Mer Marion's first sound film. The film um, that, the first film in which audiences heard Marion Davies voice. She doesn't speak, she sings. Uh, so, so that's, that's fun. And it's also the famous singing in the rain, singing in the rain number, you know, with the Noah's Ark in the back. And where Joan does her uh, song and dance. Yes, and where Joan. Not a feeling for you. <laughs> Raise that, <laughs> Josma. <laughs> Sometimes I watch that just to like cheer myself up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. She's just like stomping around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Joan. I love Joan so much. I so mm -hmm. do. Leslie says, love the Patsy and show people. Yay. Leslie, the Patsy and show people are the best. Yes. Yes. And every time I've seen them on um, the big screen somewhere, like in San Francisco or, or elsewhere, people just go nuts over those movies. I mean, they are real crowd pleasers. They really, really are. And um, show people was at the San Francisco Sound Film Festival this past month. Yes. And uh, I introduced it and I was so excited that there seemed to be like this big Billy Haynes fan crowd there yes and and um and, you know you don't you don't hear that often this this thunderous applause for Billy Haynes but I to say you and I've been going to the San Francisco silent film festival at the Castro for a very long time together and I think San Francisco audiences are the best yeah I feel like in LA, you know, I love LA very much, but I feel like audiences here are kind of jaded sometimes. Yeah. But here, I just sense this tremendous, overwhelming enthusiasm in that city. Have you noticed that? Yes. And that's part of why I think it's such a shame that the Castro <laughs> has this um, looming issue, you know, with the, if, for, for people who don't know, the people who own the Castro now, the big company that owns the Castro now, is uh, planning to take out all the seats and make it a concert venue, essentially. And taking out the seats would really make it difficult, if not impossible, to show movies, especially yeah. to eliminate the sight line. Yeah. So there's a big movement to um, to to make them change their minds. 
I was there last month and I had my save the seats button and I held up signs and did mm -hmm. videos for the Art Deco Society up there. I mean, I did whatever I could. Good. Yeah, the pressure's on with them, but it remains to be seen what's going to happen. Well, it's so important that theater to, it's a hundred year old theater. Yeah. It's to the LGBT community. It's important to the whole city of San Francisco, to the film community. Like there's so many communities that that theater matters to so deeply. Yeah. And Stone comments and says, save the seats. Yes. Yes. Save the seats. I have so many memories of that theater. It's very, very special place for me. Me too. These potatoes are so good. Right? I'm kind of like, we need to log off soon so I could just shove a bunch of potatoes in my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so simple, but so flavorful. Yeah, I'm thinking this is one of these recipes I'm going to definitely put in the win column. And also, I could see myself making this again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Like things I've made that I'm like okay well that's the one time I'm gonna do that and then other ones it's like wow that's going in the rotation around here you know exactly yeah Dorothy McHale's popover is one of the ones in the in the rotation <laughs> that is in the rotation well plus the weather is kind of cool right now so I'm like hot bread is calling my name so mm -hmm. yep yeah well what do you think any more questions wraps it up I think that about wraps it up Join Lara and I here, same bat time, same bat channel, as they used to say in the old Batman shows. Mm -hmm. For our next Sunday at noon, we will make the recipe of Billy Dove and her feather cake. Yes, and watch the um, Mary and Davies Star of the Month uh, programming on TCM on Tuesdays. Absolutely. And thank you again so much for joining us all. Please stay tuned for more food, fun, and film history from Hollywood Kitchen.